Christian friends. Throughout its history, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod has confessed the sacredness of God's gift of life. The Synod has sought to understand all life issues in light of God's plan as laid out in Scripture and to confess, confess these truths even in the face of ever-changing cultural norms. I took that statement from the LCMS website. As it has done on numerous occasions in the past, the LCMS passed a resolution at its convention this past summer in line with its commitment to life. The resolution was titled to encourage and support more fervent teaching, proclamation, and efforts to promote culture of life among God's people. I'll only quote the final resolve that the Synod encourage all pastors and congregations to preach and proclaim human life as sacred and in word and deed live out mercy, life, and forgiveness in Jesus Christ our Savior. In my own small way, I've tried to do just that with Sanctity of Human Life sermons from this pulpit. I can only pray that these sermons have indeed promoted a culture of life among God's people here at Zion. In a piece of Peanuts comic strip some time ago, Charlie Brown and Lucy have gotten into a discussion. Charlie Brown says to crabby Lucy, what's this I hear about you throwing Linus out of the house? That's not legal, you know. He's part of your family. Legally, you can't throw him out. Oh, yes, I can, says Lucy. Legally, a big sister can throw out a younger brother because she's bigger than he and because he bugs her all the time. She can do it, and I did it. And if you're smart, Charlie Brown, you won't get involved. And Charlie Brown with wide-eyed look on his face replies, oh, I'm very smart. Unfortunately, the crabby Lucy philosophy has found a home in American culture. For years, it was codified in the Supreme Court's ruling in the 1973 case of Roe v. Wade, the right of a woman to procure an abortion at any time during the course of her pregnancy. Though Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court in June of 22, returning the issue back to the states, it remains the gold standard for those who wish to maintain or expand its reach, as is the case here in Missouri. The issue of abortion is destroying not only innocent lives, but the very conscience and character of our nation. Some 65 million deaths by abortion in the past 50 years will do that to a nation. A decision for or against abortion doesn't exist in a vacuum. Abortion is just the tip of the iceberg, hidden below the surface are the equally menacing threats of infanticide, and euthanasia. How we handle or mishandle the abortion issue will inevitably determine the ethic we will follow in deciding these and other human life and death problems. The Christian ethic, which once prevailed among Christians since the earliest days of the church, go back and check the Didache, for example, can be described as a sanctity of life ethic, one which acknowledges God as maker. As a result, all life is precious because it comes from God. Christians who adhere to the sanctity of life ethic proclaim with the psalmist of Psalm 103, know that the Lord is God, it is he who made us and we are his. According to this ethic, each human being is a unique creation of God with an immortal soul. All human existence, therefore, is regarded as sacred. 
What makes us special, unique, worthwhile is not determined by society's evaluation, but by God's. Human dignity is an endowment. It is bestowed by God, not achieved or earned. The value that God places on life is very clear from the scriptures. In the creation account, for example, we are told how God made man, made man in his own image with the capacity to live in a loving and lasting relationship with God. Since humans are made in the image of God, every human being is worthy of honor and respect. As James writes in the New Testament, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. These things ought not to be! Exclamation point. Since man has been made like God, to curse man is like cursing God. How much greater then to take the life of someone created in God's image. But the value God places on human life is seen not only in creation, it is seen also in redemption and sanctification. As the scriptures record for us, God did not abandon the humans he had created to the death and damnation that they now deserved on account of their rebellion. Instead, God provided a means through Christ to restore the broken relationship. God is the giver, not only of physical life, but of spiritual life as well. It is this life that God offers to all who put their trust in Jesus. God placed such high value on mankind that he sent his own son, Jesus Christ, as a human being. As one who passed through the stages of conception, birth, infancy, adolescence, and adulthood to be our Savior. As a human being with flesh and blood, like you and I, Jesus was born and lived and died, taking our sin to the cross and burying it in the empty tomb. You and I are bought with a price. In the words of the Apostle Paul, which we would have heard in last Sunday's epistle reading. And what an incredible price. Martin Luther put it in these words, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. Paul would add to his words, for emphasis, even death on a cross. There should be little doubt that the Bible is on the side of human worth and dignity. As one theologian put it, even though one may well believe in human worth without believing in the Bible, one cannot possibly believe the Bible without believing in human worth. But can we say that God places such worth also on the unborn child? <clears throat> After a reading of those remarkable verses from Psalm 139, can there be any answer but yes? Listen to the Psalms. For you, God, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. A metaphor for the mother's womb. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. God is the creator of life. But the psalmist says even more than that. God's concern for man and God's plan for man are here traced back 
before birth. The unborn child is truly hidden from the naked eye during its early stages of development in the mother's womb. Now with advances in medical technology, the growing child in the womb is no longer hidden from modern day eyes and ears. At just six weeks gestation, when the earliest abortions are performed, the unborn baby has a beating heart and a functioning circulatory system. At eight weeks, the unborn baby becomes more active and brain activity can be recorded. At week 16, an ultrasound may be able to reveal the baby's sex. What we have is a growing human being waiting for its chance to be born. Though the unborn child is hidden, hidden from the naked eye during those early stages of development, it is not hidden from God. It is not hidden to God and is already included in his purposes. That was certainly true of the prophet Jeremiah to whom God said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Note the personal pronouns used of the yet unborn Jeremiah. There are many other scriptural references to the fact that conception is God's gift, that God is the creator of the unborn, and that prenatal life has special value before God and stands in relationship to him. When these are taken together, they speak out forcefully for the sanctity of human life already before birth. On this Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, we want to recall not only that life comes to us as a gift of God, he is our maker, but that human lives are entrusted by God to our care. God's people are caretakers. That's especially the case with the weak, the unwanted, the outcast, the helpless. While they may lack the dignity or worth which society assigns to those who are useful or beautiful or wanted, they don't lack the dignity or worth that God gives to each of his creatures. Above all, we recognize that each human being is someone for whom Christ died. He died no less for them than he did for you or me. Through that faith which the Holy Spirit works in our hearts, God empowers us to do his will. He empowers us to be his agents in providing support for the neighbor he calls us to love. That includes the neighbor still in the womb, the neighbor confined to a wheelchair or bed, the neighbor behind prison walls, the neighbor who is hungry and homeless, the neighbor who has a different color skin. God empowers us to raise our voices to protect the unborn and all who are threatened by an anti-life effort. He empowers us to provide love, care, and support for them. God empowers us to face the world's hatred, which inevitably flows or follows when we stand for God's principles. Those who chant the mantra, my body, my choice, and it's my body and I can do with it what I want. They don't take kindly to those who suggest the opposite. Based on God's word, you are not your own for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. That's St. Paul again. And what he is saying is that we don't have a right to do anything we please with our own body, as some in Paul's day were arguing, and as many argue today. We only have a right to use our bodies in ways that glorify God. Our Lord empowers us to love not merely in word or in tongue, but in deed 
and the intruders. It's one thing, for example, to tell a mother to keep her child rather than kill it, to give birth to her child and offer it for adoption. It's another to provide the economic and emotional support that will help her make the right decision. That may include supporting an organization such as Lutheran Family and Children's Services, Lutherans for Life, or a pregnancy care center. It's easy to become apathetic, to pass by on the other side, to find excuses for not speaking up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for not providing care to those who are in need. The crabby Lucy's warn us, or is it threaten us? Don't get involved. The Christ model of love leaves us no choice. God's word calls us to action. It is God's undeserved love offered freely in his son Jesus Christ that compels us to act. It is the same undeserved love which offers God's word of pardon to us and to all who have failed God by our words or actions. In God's mercy, there is forgiveness. Forgiveness for those who have been apathetic, who have watched passively as millions of unborn have been deprived the most basic right of all, the right to life. Forgiveness also for those who have themselves participated in taking the lives of the unborn. God has good news. Great good news. No sin is unforgivable. Christ died for the likes of a David who committed adultery and murder. For Peter who denied his Lord, for St. Paul who persecuted the church and claimed for himself the title chief of sinners. It's presumptuous then to claim that you are too great a sinner for God to forgive. Repentance and faith open the door to forgiveness. Where there is both sorrow for sin and faith in God's promise to forgive our sins for Jesus' sake, God's wonderful word applies. Isaiah, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. So how about 1 John? And the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. You heard it in the form of the absolution earlier in the service. I close with this thought from Lutherans for Life. They're a great resource, by the way. The love of Christ's gospel meets people where they are in their sin, but does not leave them there. It frees them from the crushing weight of sin and guilt and brings them to new life as they are restored in their relationship with their creator and live the life God originally intended for them. Only thing to add is to repeat and personalize Psalm 103. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made you and you are his. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.